Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. In response to allegations of Medicaid fraud, New Mexico stopped payments to more than a dozen behavioral health providers in 2013. A controversial move left some communities without services, and providers say they didn't get due process. The resulting mess is the subject of a new documentary, The Shakeup. Here's a preview. What happens when you take away these services? These people just kind of go away. They say, well, I guess I didn't need that service, or I guess I don't deserve that service. Or they just quietly disappear. And joining me now in studio for the half hour, director Ben Altenberg and editor and director of photography, Field Humphrey. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you for having Thank us. us. All right, Ben, to start with uh, talking with you about this, we, we had a chance to sit down a little before the program uh, and talk about this documentary. Tell me how you came upon the story and then made the decision that this really needed uh, a full hour to explain what happened and the ramifications of what the state did. Well, it started out, uh, heck, back in 2015. Um, I was living in Austin, or I'm still living in Austin, Texas, uh, working in broadcast, um, and I knew I wanted a, I knew I wanted to make a social documentary of some kind. Didn't know what the topic would be or anything of the sort. Good friend of mine, uh, who was actually getting his matches in social work at New Mexico State, started telling me about what had happened back in 2013 in the aftermath, wherein 15 behavioral health providers uh, responsible for 87% of Medicaid delivery in New Mexico uh, had their funding cut off, like, like, like a switch getting turned off, on the basis that they had committed mass Medicaid fraud to the tune of $34 million. Um, there wasn't a lot of due process related to this. Uh, they were told that the allegations had been, or at, that all the evidence had been handed over to the Attorney General of New Mexico, and that they weren't going to be able to see any of it. Um, at the same time, they were informed that there was a clause that required them to continue to provide care, despite the fact that they weren't going to be compensated for any of that service. Mm. Um, and as a result, things fell apart pretty quickly. Uh, they also brought in uh, some companies from Arizona to take over services uh, for all these companies. Um, and it seemed like they believed that this would be just a clean transfer that would not disrupt services for consumers. Uh, and that was a grave error. Yeah, of course, that did not happen. And of course, not getting payments uh, from Medicaid, uh, a lot of these companies, uh, nonprofits, etc., said we can't do this anymore. Uh, Field, even in the first clip, we see uh, that as director of photography and editor in this, you really show uh, New Mexico's landscape in the film. People get to know the state, and it really becomes a character in the film. And for me, added a lot of weight hearing the stories as I saw the landscape. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's definitely how uh, Ben initially planned it. So he did a very good job kind of laying out that he did, like you're saying, uh, want to make the state a character in the film. And so, 
you know, we had a lot of reference materials, some old school documentaries like Pilot Broke the Plane, The River, some really like some black and white documentaries with nice, clean, static or like slow pans across this landscape. And that was kind of our vision going in to capture something like that and kind of the beauty and kind of intrigue of the state. And so um, Patrick, our producer, who also helped shoot the uh, documentary, it was our first time actually out to the state of New Mexico. So we were like in awe. So like what you're seeing in the film and the B-roll and the landscapes, it's us experiencing, yeah. experiencing it for the first time too. So And it lends itself to a very important topic in the film that, you know, healthcare is one of many examples when you're in a rural area and you have these vast distances between maybe a doctor's office and someone's home. Uh, when you play around with that, it can really cause havoc. We have another clip now. We're going to go to far northeastern New Mexico, the town of Clayton. Let's take a look. Today's uh, Monday, and I have to be there by at least 11 o'clock because my first appointment's at 11. I love the big skies. I love the idea that I can see for miles and miles. Uh, actually, this is uh, rabbit ears before you get to Clayton, and I am happy when I see those because I know I'm very close to Clayton. Uh, about 15 miles out, you can start seeing them and go, yo, I'm almost there, almost there. Clayton used to have a lot of services for children. They were providing good services to the community. The state of New Mexico pulled their funding, so that, that left no services for children in Clayton other than when we started coming in. They don't have the therapy that is required for people with substance abuse, people uh, for depression, for severe SDMI that need a little um, follow-up. So we're the only ones that provide that type of service in Clayton. Uh, nobody else does. I came here in 1979. I hate to refer to that. It makes me look like the old man sitting on the chair, just talking about the old days. I have several families that I am in their fourth generation of providing services. I treated the grandma, I treated the mother, and now I'm treating the son. Ben, just a few thousand people in that town of Clayton, it really highlights uh, the damage inflicted, as I mentioned earlier, when there are you know, health care changes of any kind in small communities. Yes. Um, in a state like New Mexico uh, that, struggles to, uh, that struggles with being able to fund these programs in the first place, rural health care has never been ideal. Um, and the impact of the entire system being shaken up uh, has been devastating to frontier communities like Clayton. Um, and, we, and we should say, I mean, in, in, it's bad in any case absolutely. around the country, but particularly bad in New Mexico, not only because of these small rural communities where you may have, for instance, one provider uh, in a certain field like behavioral health, or maybe none, that ha they may have to travel to a community. Uh, we also have that aspect, this was cutting off Medicaid funding. And we have one of the highest percentages of the population on Medicaid. More than 40% of the state's residents are on Medicaid. Yes. And we have a character in our film. Uh, she's a foster mother of eight in Clayton. Um, all those kids need therapy and medication. And with the way the apparatus is set up right now, she was being expected to drive to Raton, which is 86 miles away, to get intake for those kids. Uh, and so their only real option is Ralph, uh, who volunteers his own time uh, in retirement to provide therapy to those communities. That He's their lifeline. He's all they have. Amazing dedication. And Field, I know you were there for many of these interviews. At the end of that uh, segment with 
uh, Ralph Moya uh, that Ben was referencing, he mentions that as a behavioral health provider, he sees um, issues with multiple generations in one particular family. Uh, tell me about some of the, a story or any a particular group of stories that stood out to you. I think it was just, and we actually included in the documentary, uh, you know, that entire experience in Clayton was really powerful. Mm -hmm. And like going in after shooting and kind of us unpacking and what we experienced during the day and like this incredible family, well, like having din bringing us over for dinner, welcoming us in their home and sharing their story. I think just overall seeing Mary with her eight uh, kids uh, running her own business just really grinding and, and the state not helping her out at all and kind of throwing her to the wolves. Um, I think just that entire experience in Clayton was one of the most powerful things. And, and just the power of a mother that cares. I mean, there's a scene we have um, where one of her, her uh, children who needs behavioral health care comes running in from uh, being dropped off by the school bus and she's crying and devastated something had happened at school and she just runs straight to her mom mary and she just embraces her and just the calmness and just the love was something that really like impacted us and like i know we can't even like watch that clip uh in the editing room without kind of like tearing up too and it's been we've seen it like a million times yeah. but that is the beauty of, of of having a full hour to be able to really tell these stories uh and there's such emotional weight to this but also uh, it, it's such a serious matter, and this kind of work, hopefully, will highlight this kind of issue so this kind of thing doesn't happen again, in, at least in the state of, of New Mexico. Ralph Moya, uh, who we saw in that clip, uh, works for people um, without payment. He lives off of his, his retirement fund, so this also highlights the dedication and feel to use your word love the love of these folks for other people it's a love of the region he grew up in he's originally from newkirk or a ranch kind of outside of newkirk uh ralph is one of the most incredible people i've ever met in my life uh and he if you go back and look at his story um he was the only trained social worker for eleven thousand square miles in northeastern new mexico in the 80s driving everywhere to do what he could. And he got burned out uh, at, at, at one point, which I think is a very common experience for, for caseworkers in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, didn't do it for a while, um, but eventually he came back. Once, once the system fell apart, he felt some, uh, something deep down to, to really to go out there and just, just go to work. And he is hoofing it. I mean, he was working in Clayton morning to night it was 10 p.m he was still in the office because it's not just therapy it's paperwork it's you know that's two-thirds of the battle another aspect of what we call a healthcare system in the united states but many critics say uh it's it's not the right name for it we have a dysfunctional uh, situation not only in beha behavioral health but uh it really all centers around the fact that for most people, uh, this is a healthcare industry, and it's driven on uh, profits and not on service to people. We have another clip now from the documentary The Shakeup. If you are just joining us, the film looks at the Martinez administration's decision to suspend Medicaid payments to behavioral health providers in 2013. What happens when you take away these services? These people just kind of go away. They say, well, I guess I didn't need that service, or I guess I don't deserve that service, or, or they just quietly disappear. You build up this trust and you get it in the home and you're working with these families and they're doing great and then the service provider changes. And we have to start all over from ground zero. They were like, mm -mm, we, we can't. We can't tell our story a third time. We just can't, it's too hard. 
my phone still rings. I still get phone calls. Where can I get services? I don't like what's happening here. Where do I go? What do we do? Because they don't trust the system anymore and they disengage, you lose them. So where are they? I have a, a client who I worked really hard for, whose case I'm gonna close to say, I did nothing for you. Despite the hours and hours and hours worth of work that I put in trying to navigate this system, and I'm a lawyer, and my client's exhausted and said, I'm, I'll just figure it out. I don't wanna do this anymore. Um, and I'm hoping that her kid makes it to his 18th birthday. I really am. Field, you do such a good job uh, along with the team in this film in bringing out these stories and showing uh, New Mexico. There is, as we saw there, a real connection that um, many of these providers have with their clients. And we talked about that briefly this was broken uh, when the Medicaid payments were cut off. Other stories that, that really stood out to you? Um, I mean, to speak more directly of like how providers were impacted, um, one of our first shoots, uh, we went with Nancy Jo Archer, who was a former provider for Hogaris, and we went to the building um, where she served thousands of clients over decades, and it was just, abandoned and you know getting torn down and or uh, I think it was getting fixed up to be sold and you know so we actually had access to the building where she worked and, and you know had a career and cared for people and so we walked around the building and ended up finding old photos of some of the kids she cared for and went through those photos so that was really powerful too just walking around the grounds and seeing her get emotional and and just being in that environment again and seeing it all empty and seeing, you know, none of her coworkers, none of her loved ones, none of the people she cared for there anymore, just empty, um, was really, really powerful. And actually we, um, we finished up shooting her interview and what was insane was, um, there are obviously some people, some homeless people living on the property. There's some mattresses mm -hmm. and, you know, syringes and stuff, which is deeply, you know, dark irony that the place that helped people with drug addiction was now, you know, people were using and, yeah. and, and sleeping. And actually a kid rolled up when uh, we finished up with her and he was, he used to um, be helped at Hogaris. And now he's a homeless, you know, living on the streets, in the building, on a mattress. Um, it was really, really sad and, yeah. and, and really kind of stuck with us too. Yeah. And then I imagine for, for you, talking with folks as a uh, director of this film and, and deciding uh, to take on this project, this is really also a larger story about poverty. And of course, New Mexico is one of the poorest states in the nation. Yes, um, it's certainly a big part of it. and. I'm trying to think of and, and you, yeah. I mean, you, you're familiar with the state because you'd lived in Albuquerque, right? I grew up in Albuquerque. Grew up, grew up yes. in Albuquerque. Yeah. Um, it's a tough. It's it's kind of tough to figure out how to approach it uh, from a filmmaking perspective, because it's really not about uh, gazing upon the most dire circumstances. You know, just like a, a person on the street lying there, mm -hmm. you know, on the verge of starvation. That's not really the way to communicate the issues to people, or I think this in a way that resonates with them. Um, the way that I've found, I think, in, in terms of what I've been influenced by uh, as far as documentary filmmakers is um, you can just show how these folks are just like everyone else, especially with children mm. and how easy it is to see how bright they are and how if they had a system available for them to treat 
say, emotional instability, something, something, you know, a behavioral health issue, if they had the resources, they could go about like anybody else, and it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. But because there aren't these options, it's chaos. Absolutely. We have one more clip now from the film The Shakeup, and this gets to the stunning revelations about the basis for the state's decision to cut Medicaid payments in some cases. It's my opinion today that this process into the behavioral health investigation has taken too long and citizens deserve better. The right professionals on the front end of this case needed to quickly determine what was overbilling uh, and what was worthy of a criminal investigation. And this is the process that we're focused on right now. Ultimately, the attorney general's office over the years had cleared all 15 providers of Medicaid fraud, and in certain cases said that there might have been billing errors, these kind of smaller errors that didn't rise to the level of intentionally defrauding the Medicaid program. I, I am concerned that there was a better way to attack waste, fraud, and abuse. A lot of the journalists around the state were interested in the issue for the simple fact that the state was refusing to release the audit. A couple news organizations sued for the audit, and eventually a judge ordered release of only portions of the audit, but not the full audit, which was not released until years later. Then we got the information as to what they utilized to say that we had committed fraud, and all of them were clinical or documentation issues. They couldn't read a person's signature, so they denied the claim as fraudulent because they couldn't read the person's signature. Sure, somebody was missing a date. Somebody missed a time in, time out. Just day-to-day -day human error. Ben, I really like that clip because even though this news organization reported on this, to hear some of the specific ways in which these providers were being accused of fraud, and not just being accused of fraud, but being accused of fraud and then being told, well, we, we, can't, we can't show you why you're being accused of fraud. We can't, we can't release that information. And then, as you point out in the clip, resisting the release of the information, even though New Mexico has a broad Public Records Act, one of the, uh, what's called one of the best in the country, the, it's called IPRA, the Inspection of Public Records Act. But yet, in this case, we see that sometimes there is a lack of transparency, uh, even though there is this law which is supposed to promise almost complete transparency in terms of public records, protecting the public's right to know. What was your reaction to this when you discovered that this was this, uh, what critics say is egregious situation? I would say that the scandal itself is really what got us into this topic. Um, I don't think it's where our story ended, um, and we learned a lot along the way, but in my travels, that's a lofty way to say this, but uh, in my time talking to you know, countless people about this topic, it takes me about three sentences to get through what happened at the start of there and then, and then get to the audit and say that the audit itself, which was withheld from people for years, actually did not say what they claimed it did. Um, anybody I've talked to gets incredulous pretty rapidly. It's so easy on its face to understand why it, it feels so dicey. And without being able to tell you truly what the motives were behind it, um, I can say it was, it, it seems like it was birthed out of a very cozy public-private relationship that uh, lacked the oversight that it was supposed to have. Yeah. Field, you know, uh, with or without insurance, uh, the nation continues to struggle with health care, not just behavioral health care, all health care. Um, and there is a growing movement in the country for some sort of a single-payer healthcare system, what almost every industrialized nation has. 
Some could argue this film makes a good argument for that, that states are able to make changes sometimes that would be much harder, much more difficult to do when you have a federal system, when it affects the entire nation. And a lot of people are watching. You know, a great example of that is, you know, we're talking about Medicaid here, which is a, a federally funded but a state-run system. Every state is different. Uh, Medicare uh, for the disabled and uh, older Americans is a national system, not just funded by the federal government, but it is run federally, and it has extremely high satisfaction rates. People are generally very happy with Medic Medicare, and it has very low administrative expenses. What are, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I by no means am a expert on the <laughs> on the topic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's become such a polarizing topic as well across the country. Um, I think all I can really speak to is that there needs to at least be some legislative safeguards to prevent this from happening. Yeah. At the very least, you can't just, without due process, wipe out Medicaid funding. I don't know what the solution is overall for the healthcare system, Medicaid, Medicare. Yeah. yeah. I can't really speak to that. I just know that at the very least, we should all get together and prevent something like this from happening in another state. I have about a minute left. I think that community engagement is a crucial facet of it. Um, you know, back in 04, during the Richardson administration, they put together the Behavioral Health Collaborative with that aim, and it didn't exactly work out the way that we wanted it to. Um, it's possible that we can try again. I also don't have answers, but to me, I think if providers and patients on the ground have more of a voice uh, in Santa Fe, then, you know, maybe we can do something. Matt, whatever the issue, that's really Certainly. what it's all about, yeah. isn't it? Community engagement. Ben and Field, thank you both for sharing this and for your work. This is important work, and we appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you at home as well. That is our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's Morning Edition, 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by Here and Now, Noon to 2, and All Things Considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org, and we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.